that's a not experience as it pertains to this year. Treatment, as I mentioned, and vaccination most importantly. Um, so, a little bit about some of the historical aspects to get you up to date and also bring you back into the realm of influenza. This season has actually not been predominantly, or it's not been very heavy so far, but I have to say the caveat there is it's mid January, we're starting to see a peak in Europe, in particular in Western Europe. And we're starting to see a pickup all over the United States, especially in southeastern part of the United States, as well as uh, some areas in, in the uh, Northeast as well. So, influence is actually fascinating. This is a lot of things that was the first of the things that was used to affect history. In fact, it's probably 300 outbreaks of influenza over the last 700 or 800 years, starting back in 1173. If you read a book recently that looked at it called Flu, she describes what it was like in 431 BCE and the time of the Athenians when they suffered from an influenza epidemic. So it goes back thousands of years and it's just, it can be a kind of incredibly deadly disease if the population has no immunity. The greatest pandemic that we know of actually occurred in 1918 and that was uh, called the Spanish flu, most likely because there wasn't any real control of press in Spain during wartime. Turns out that it was all over the World that probably started in Pasco County, Texas. If you read the Great Influence of Don Barry, he talks about that story. So, if you read that, tell the textbook, they'll say 21 million, but the reality is they've had so many dead bodies accumulated so quickly during that epidemic, it's probably more likely there was between 50 and 100 million people who died. Inactivity vaccines really became um, um, available in the 1940s. So the first time I've seen we had in 2003, and then we had medications such as N2 inhibitors, which you probably know as Mantine and Romantine in the 1960s, then 1993 and and the Neuraminase inhibitors, which are probably most familiar with from last year's Tamiflu, because it was so in the middle, came out in 2000. So what do you think of influenza? We have just a brief reverse. It's a more thing mixed up here today. There's three types of influenza. Influenza A, B, and C. Influenza A is what we see circulating predominantly in the year because it's able to alter itself, and that's the predominant one. Although we do see influenza B, less so influenza C. Who are the people who traditionally have high, high risk? It's the elderly, the young, the immunocompromised, especially pregnant women. However, last year, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic influenza, the problem that was most concerning was that there seemed to be a subsegment of the population that did not fit that category, and that was the younger people, predominantly slightly obese, who actually became severely ill and died. This is actually analogous to what happened in 1918. We saw younger people in the population, people between 18 and 49, who became sick and died. And the reason we can find that is that last year, the age of the was actually somewhat similar to the 1918 virus, meaning that people who had been it's exposed to similar life viruses from 1957. Many other individuals had some immunity. People born after 1957 had really no immunity. So it was a scary situation because here you have a disease that usually affects elderly, immunocompromised people, and it's not just affected people in the bottom of the life, 18 to 39 years old, who what we don't get sick. I actually saw a couple of cases last year of one being in their 50s, a gentleman in his 30s, one that came in. Asthma, upper respiratory like illness, slightly obese, certainly decompensated, incredibly depression, both about the RDS. Both of them had influence on H1N1 and actually shed the virus from the So, seasonal influenza is something that comes about every year. Most of them realize there's 36,000 deaths per year, 200,000 hospitalizations per year. And the economic cost is actually fairly significant, so hard to measure. But if you think about the number of people who stay out, the number of people who have to take care of children because they're sick, it's actually a fairly significant cause. That's why vaccination is actually one of the more important reasons to vaccinate. As I mentioned, the severity of an epidemic is more or less determined by the amount of immunity in the population. So if you have a population that has been previously exposed to a virus that's similar to one that's circulated in the past, then most people have some residual immunity. What happens is if you do have a virus that is able to shift or drift, which I'll touch on in a few minutes, you'll have a situation where nobody has any real immunity, and then the virus is able to spread rapidly from person to person. What determines that? That's basically based on its individual proteins, which I'll touch on briefly. You know, this is a little bit more biochemical. 16 of these, which you call HA subtypes, which is 
she's never seen. All of a sudden, everybody gets sick. Slowly, a new male body forms. People are more and more used to it. Every year comes back, the number of people get sick is less. And then you can have a shift from HSNX to, let's say, something different H3N2 or something different. So that's why all of a sudden you'll have a new virus that's actually shifted over to something else and a new pandemic. So, what do I mean? So, as I mentioned, the great influenza was one of the episodes where you had a shape shift from previously a particular virus to something else, whatever you want. It may not mean any other population. And it's been a simple shift throughout history. So, for instance, in 1957, there was a shift from H2N2 to um, a severe pandemic. As I mentioned, in October to H2N2, as I mentioned, prior to 1918, you can see it was something called H3N8. 1918, H1N1 caused the great pandemic because nobody had ever seen this. This was a major, major shift. Again, another shift occurred in 1952, all of a sudden H1N1 disappeared and H2N2 appeared. Another popular, but another major shift occurred in 1968 from H2N2 and H3N2. So we still see circulating at this time. And then you may remember in 1976, there was another story working for a drug break called the drug break. And that actually was something that was not as good, did not become as concerning as it possibly could have, but it was similar to this recent 2008 drug break. So what I get at here is that the virus is always shifting and drifting, so we're never able to conquer this disease. So I went back to the 2009 drug break, and what I touched on Influenza season. A lot of time is unpredictable, but right now we're approaching the peak of the season. I'd say mid January every year is when you see the most people starting to get sick. This year, maybe a little bit later, February, March. It can occur as next May. As I mentioned, I'll touch on with the few slides later. It's starting to come out more and more this year. Classic symptoms you probably will aware of fever, sore throat, runny or stuffy nose, body aches, headaches, chills. You also know. But now that we last year for 2009, we had a little bit of a twinkle, and we just did a lot of dominating diarrhea. How does it spread? Well, it's usually a lot of droplets, coughing, sneezing, and coughing, sneezing, like touch this or sneeze on it, and hours, and it's like somebody else comes and touches it, puts it on a regular epithelium, and every which way you can imagine that it can easily spread. So it's easily spread. Uh, what's interesting is that you know, a couple of people can actually spread uh, and shed the virus for upwards of five days. Children who are used to breast patients can shed it for weeks on end. And as I mentioned last year, when I saw this patient here in Arizona, women in their 50s with asthma, slightly obese, came with a respiratory infection, we couldn't figure out exactly what was wrong. She could come to the next day and said, Would you like to see you with you? Yes. Terrible case of 2009 H1N1 pandemic flu. She shed the virus for weeks. I'm talking about I checked the H1N1 PCR probably four or five days into the illness. I checked it again three weeks later, so it's still showing the virus. There's no real, uh, I think that was a real showing of the truly a real kind of a master here. So this is probably a synopsis of how it influences. But you know about this, that's the only way you can protect yourself wearing a mask. So I've been wasting stuff for this year. Okay, so January 1st is the most recent updated flu rule. If you go to cdc.gov, you're able to find these slides and these most recent numbers. And so far, as of week 52, they've tested around 5,000 specimens. 995 have come back positive. 20% of patients. So far, what we see is predominantly influenza A, which is not surprising. We have seen actually quite a bit of influenza B, which is around 34%. We haven't seen as much in 2009 H1N1. So we have not been away from the influenza that we've seen actually H3N2. A lot of times they don't do the same target, but if they did, it would be H3N2. 
because you usually are sick for 24 hours before you can realize it, and you're symptomatic for 24 hours, and you can have lots of symptoms. And through this, it's not going to be as effective as providing it. I would vaccinate uh, everybody to take it out until the, probably the beginning of May. So people say, oh, look, the influence is this is pretty high. I don't need to vaccinate. I'll take it out now. We can continue to get vaccinated right now. Animal vaccination this year was recommended for everybody at those six months of age. So, for example, we should get vaccinated. Everybody about six months of age should get vaccinated. Last year, we had all these sort of guidelines. You have to be, if you're really 49 and you have such, such conditions, now it's across the board. Anybody should get vaccinated for about six months of age. One caveat is that if you're a child and you're, you're, uh, you're vaccinated last year, you do need two doses. Most people just need one dose. As, well. as I mentioned, this year's vaccine is very similar to the for the community. We've got California 2009 H1N1, Perth 2009 H3N2, based on what we saw in the southern hemisphere last season, and Brisbane 2008, which is what we're seeing so far in the influence of these in the community. Now, the other impacted patients we've seen for many years.
Thank you. 